Aviation consistently ranks as the safest mode of public transportation, and it retains that status thanks to the dedication of countless people quietly working behind the scenes. In this video, we'll introduce you to some of them as we explore Delta Airlines Tech Ops, one of the world's largest facilities dedicated entirely to the maintenance and repair of aircraft. Hello, Jet Setters. I'm Jeb Brooks from Greenergrass.com. Right now, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, right here outside Delta Airlines Tech Ops. This is their maintenance facility here in Atlanta, and they do incredible things inside. Join me as we check it all out. This facility first opened in 1960 and has expanded through the years to its current size of, get this, 2.7 million square feet. That's the equivalent of 47 football fields. The space is just mind-blowingly big. But it's the people who make it remarkable. In fact, 6,000 of them work here. We'll meet a few along the way, and if you keep watching, I'll even show you how you can join the team if you're interested. Aircraft maintenance is a highly regimented, methodical, and carefully planned effort. Maintenance programs, that's essentially the schedule of what gets checked out when, are tailored to specific aircraft types. But let's get into it. Let's start here, in this hangar. But first, what we'll highlight in this video is routine maintenance. Let me know in the comments below if you'd be interested in seeing a separate video about line maintenance. That's when uh, maintenance professionals engage in daily checks of airplanes, routine in-service inspections, and troubleshooting planes that may run into in-service issues. Obviously, the need to make airplanes aerodynamic means getting to components isn't always convenient. For example, this 767's jack screw, now that's the part that raises and lowers the airplane's horizontal stabilizer, is only accessible through this tiny door to what maintenance professionals lovingly call the hell hole. There's the jack screw up there. This space is also home to the pressure bulkhead. It's that dome that helps ensure the cabin remains pressurized at altitude. When maintainers need to work on the electronic components in airplanes, they often enter through a tiny door like this one near the front of the fuselage. Here I am coming up into the electronics compartment of this 767. This is a part of the plane you really never see. These components are all modular, allowing them to be easily swapped out if there's a problem or need for routine maintenance. Also, look how carefully these miles and miles of wiring are handled. From there, we were also able to access the cargo area, and like most of the spaces we visited on board, it's cramped, but perfectly suited for its job. These rollers and locks ensure cargo doesn't shift in flight. And no visit to an empty jet can be called complete unless you check out the cockpit. But as I looked around at this massive machine and the others parked throughout these hangars, my mind turned to the parts. I mean, maintaining these planes surely takes a ton of parts and pieces, tools and components, and it's not like you can just run over to Home Depot to grab what you need. So where do the new parts come from, and when they get here, how are they sorted and checked? For that, let's meet Malcolm Myers for an overview of how new parts are received here at Tech Ops. We take material, we move it through our process as quickly as we possibly can in order to make it serviceable for me uh, mechanics to get the inventory to their aircraft as soon as possible. It's a very fast moving operation where we are basically trying to get uh, material on its way, right? This is not a holding place for material. This process right here is not for any material to stay here. It's to get received in, ready for serviceability, or ready to be sent to a shop for further repair or serviceability. Uh, but this area right here allows us to navigate that material on its way. This is the main hub, and you're gonna get basically 85 to 90% of all of your new parts coming through this process. Once those new parts and materials are received, logged, and quality checked, they have to go somewhere, and that's where these bins come in. An automated system can pick any part in a matter of only a few seconds before it's ready to be delivered anywhere in the Delta system, as in pretty much anywhere on Earth. If you think about the number of pieces and parts that are required for an operation like this, it's overwhelming. So back here in this section, there are probably hundreds of thousands of parts uh, stored right here, and they can access them at almost no time when they're needed out on the floor. Pretty incredible. Delta has exacting standards, which means not every part they receive is accepted. And when that happens, they go here. Hey, look, it's, uh, it's my second home. In addition to that main warehouse, Delta operates a number of smaller facilities throughout Atlanta, 
with more frequently needed parts like fasteners, even safety cards. But it's not all about new parts. Delta has a number of departments focused solely on refurbishing components. So there's so many different parts and pieces that Delta uh, really goes out of their way to, to repair them uh, right here at Tech Ops. And the reason for that is because if they were to go out and, and buy new parts, they'd be inordinately expensive. But not only that, Delta is able to maintain the quality of those repairs right here with these professionals who uh, do, as we've seen so far, an incredible job maintaining these aircraft. One such department is the hot section shop where I discovered the mesmerizing low vacuum and low pressure plasma thermal spray process. It uses a plasma process to clean parts before they're checked to see whether they need additional repairs. But its operator, Bobby Pike, has a much better name for it. AKA the flux capacitor. It's designed to clean the part in zero atmosphere for it to eliminate any oxidation and impurities in the metal. That's just one of the many steps taken here to ensure parts operate at their peak. Others in the hot shop include furnaces that heat parts up to thousands of degrees for hours at a time to ensure they're completely clean. And once they're cleaned, some parts need to be coated with special materials. And for that, we turn to Phil Bennett. We work on small engine parts over here and then small landing gear parts. That's what we mainly work on, so it'd be like uh, bolts, uh, mounts, uh, any gears for the engines. So we bring them in, say after a chrome strip, we take them, we uh, do all the research, and then uh, we measure the dimensions, see how much chrome they need, and we'll go and we'll plate them a little bit over the maximum dimensions, and then that'll go to the machine shop, and then they'll machine it down to the uh, final maximum dimension. The work is kind of uh, artistic, so you get to put your own little touch on everything you do. This shop, filled with its vats of bubbling chemicals, reminded me of my high school chemistry lab, only if it were on steroids. One thing I do recall from chemistry was that it, it often smelled bad, but they have a clever solution to reduce those smells here. They use these balls. Put those balls in there to keep the smells down. Otherwise, this place would reek. Some of the parts are even silver-plated because that's what they require to operate most effectively. Now, when it comes to tech ops, as critical as warehousing and cleaning, coding and machining parts is, equally vital is ensuring the quality of that work. And there are a number of ways it's done. For example, there's this 3D structured light scanner, which is a rare piece of equipment for an airline MRO to operate. But Delta uses it because it speeds up their ability to find potential faults in parts. They also use magnetism and fluorescence to look for invisible problems and components. For more about that, let's turn to Andrew Dodson. Okay, so this is our magnetic particle inspection room. Uh, this is one of our older machines. We have two areas in which we do mag particle inspection. It shoots a current through the part. Now what that does is it creates a positive and negative field along any imperfections in the parts, depending on which way we shoot it. But that's not all. They also use temporary coatings and black lights to find parts with imperfections that are otherwise imperceptible. In this particular spot, they're using all kinds of technology, everything from x-rays to eddy currents to ultrasonic testing to make sure that parts are as safe as they possibly can be. This is a boroscope to look inside uh, for any cracks in the turbine blades. Absolutely incredible technology. But what if they need to replace a part they simply can't get? Enter Mitch Reif and the Additive Manufacturing Team, colloquially known as 3D Printing. So one big thing with additive manufacturing is really kind of cutting down on time when it comes to assisting the shop. So whether that be tools that the shop needs, uh, whether it be, when I say tools, that could be tools that are used for shop painting. It could be tools that are used for masking. It could be tools that are used for uh, specific operations on, the, uh, on an engine where it may be difficult to get to a, a certain nut, we can then take the ergonomics into account, look at you know what, would, what could we design that could help the mechanic actually work on this more easily. A big part as well is that a lot of our training, especially flight attendant training, has, has to be done on a, in an aircraft fuselage that is exactly the same as the fuselage that we're going to be working on. If it's a 321, it's a 321 environment that has everything the 321 would have on it. And that includes a real telephone. 
The problem is when you're going through training, a telephone may fall on the ground and break, and then you have to buy a new one. That new telephone can be multiple thousands of dollars. But that phone itself, it's not on an actual aircraft. It doesn't need to meet all the requirements. So we're able to print a replacement for that phone at you know, $10 instead of multiple thousands of dollars and not wait two months to get that phone. It's literally, we need one, two days later you have it. It's not just plastic. I mean, this piece right here is metal. They can, they can print metal as well. TechOps does not just focus on individual parts. Complex components also need repair. So let's meet Tammy, who works to fix critical cockpit components like this audio selector panel. It's a switching unit, basically, for the radio systems. And it basically directs, these are mic buttons that allow the pilot to talk. And uh, these are the ones that allow them to listen. And you can adjust the volume and such. But um, when they go bad, we fix them. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a bad unit. They're, they're very hardy. Um, they're usually the first thing pulled because it's the easiest to pull off the aircraft and check. Every shop we entered just served to remind me how complex airplanes are. From seats, to windows, from coffee makers, to ovens, all of it is serviced here. In fact, Delta's so good at this work, other airlines from around the world contract their work to these professionals. But let's turn our attention to the components that are, perhaps, the most mission critical and complex, jet engines. And their complexity is probably why so much space here at Tech Ops is dedicated to keeping them running safely and at optimum performance. There's a lot that goes into these motors. You don't really think about how complex an engine is, but they do here. In this facility, engines are uh, disassembled, repaired, and then reassembled before they're tested to make sure they're safe. These things are incredibly, incredibly complex. But here's something that kind of boils it down. The air that flows in up there is minus 50 degrees below zero. It's 50 degrees below zero. By the time it gets to about here, it's 500 degrees. At Tech Ops, fan blades and compressor blades are ever so carefully removed. Parts are uncoupled from each other, and everything is sent out to various corners of this facility for testing and, if necessary, repair. And here to talk about the kinds of stresses these engines will be under when they're back in the air is Rodney LeMay. All right, what we're looking at here is the compressor part of the engine. We call it the compressor because what it basically does is as the engine pulls in the air with the fan blades up front, it starts to compress the, uh, the air. As you can see, each different stage gets smaller and smaller. So imagine the size of a plate this big getting down to something this size. A lot of pressure in that area. Engines also have mechanical brains called gearboxes. They link the engine to components like the starter, or pumps for hydraulics, fuel, and oil. Even the electrical generators, which power everything from the flight systems to your own seat back entertainment. Not to mention the engine electrical power through a small generator that powers the FADEC, another component that's tested on these machines. Needless to say, the complexity is overwhelming. And behind heavy doors like this one is where it all comes together inside engine test cells. These cutting edge facilities allow tech ops professionals to safely test engines on the ground. Delta is home to the largest engine test cell in North America. Let's go check it out. So no, I have not uh, gotten a new hairdo up here. These are actually uh, cowlings that go on the engine uh, before it goes to the test cell to simulate the airflow around the engine as though it were on an airplane. Makes it a more accurate uh, way to measure uh, how the engine's running. And here to tell us a little bit more about what happens in here is James O'Brien. Uh, we test uh, Trent engines for uh, Delta Airlines and Rolls Royce. Uh, when they come back from the uh, engine shop, we need to run them, run them through some parameters, make sure they they make thrust, they make oil pressure, they make just vibration. We test for these different uh, items for the manual. And, that, that room right there that you see on the screens is actually on the other side of this wall. Uh, about two and a half feet of concrete, Coming reinforced down. concrete, uh, keep us safe. Uh, that engine can produce about 78,000 pounds of thrust while we test it. Um, the cell is capable of a 150,000 pound thrust engine, but there's none, none uh, in service right now that go that high. We're, we're there, we can do it if they, if they come up with it. 
Everything I'd seen that day came together when we had the opportunity of a lifetime. You see, this engine, capable, as James said, of 78,000 pounds of thrust, had reached a point in its test where it was idle. And we got to enter the test cell. The sheer scale of what Delta Tech Ops does here became self-evident. It was so loud and, frankly, beautiful, even at idle and even with our hearing protection on. I, I mean, just listen to this. But it really is the people who make it all happen. I asked many of the people what it's like to work here at Delta, and the comments were consistent and unanimous. Uh, Delta has provided the opportunity for me to grow as a, a professional. Um, I did not think that I'd be doing it. Right? And here I am 11 years later doing something that I love to do. It's a great company. Yeah. One of my coworkers called it the Crystal Palace. Good family, people, and just, just take, take care of you. It's a great place to work. Uh, to learn more about Tech Ops, there's a link in the description below. And if you're interested in joining the team, You'll also find information about jobs below, too. Spending the day at Tech Ops has absolutely blown my mind. I hope I shared just a little piece of how incredible it is. Uh, Delta really has earned a lot of the credibility and the, the awards like this airline of the year. Uh, so well deserved, and, and today was evidence of why. Between now and the next time, see you in the sky. So here's a little known fact. Um, this was actually the original name for my YouTube channel. We're in the wheel and tire shop, uh, which is really fascinating, but more than anything, I wish I could share the smell with you. You just smell this rubber. It really, it, it's got a, a unique odor to it. I guess each section of Tech Ops has its own smell, but this is the first one I'm really noticing and, and liking. Hello from inside the cargo area of a 767. This is a part of a plane you never see, but it's vital to making Delta Airlines Tech Ops work, which really makes no sense because this, I don't even know what I'm saying right now. Uh, balances those fan blades, runs them at six or seven, and runs them fast to make sure that they run. That was stupid. That's not true, so I can't say that. 